Hi, I'm Peg Metzger, and if I were available, I would far prefer to be talking with you in person rather than to you via video. But I am very happy to be able to be providing a patient perspective, and I really want to applaud all of your efforts developing the CARE program. I also want to thank MITS for all the support that they offer in the aftermath of medically induced trauma. So I'm here, I want to let you know a little bit about who I am, um, what I do, what happened to me almost six years ago when I went into a uh, renowned Boston teaching hospital, and then I want to share a few of my biggest concerns as you implement the CARE program. I'm also a teacher and a lawyer, not a litigator, but a business and healthcare lawyer. At the time of the adverse event, I had spent over a decade at a large Boston law, law firm and then over a decade as the general counsel at Tufts Health Plan. I was 54 years old. I was then the executive director of the Massachusetts Commission on End-of-Life Care. I was also working on the regulations implementing the Massachusetts uh, health care reform legislation. I was busy. Um, two of my proudest accomplishments at Tufts Health Plan were creation of a legal department that was very good at listening and fixing problems, and also um, the development of a dispute resolution process that was very successful at eliminating virtually all litigation. There was plenty that I didn't know about healthcare, but I knew a whole lot more than the average patient who doesn't have clinical training. So, if nothing else, my experience is evidence that, me that in medicine, bad things can happen to anyone, um, no matter how well you do your research, no matter how smart you think you are, no matter what or who you know. So, what happened? Um, go with me, if you would. It's May 30th, 2007, and I enter a renowned Boston Teaching Hospital, not one that's participating in your care effort. I'm scheduled for an outpatient ERCP. It's a procedure that I understand my uh, physician performs regularly, routinely. So ERCP stands for Endoscopic Retrograde Choleangiopancreatography. It requires insertion of an endoscope down the esophagus. It's being done to detect any narrowing or blockage of my bile duct. And I understand that I will be going home that afternoon. Actually, what happens is that my doctor has been admitted for observation after the procedure. She says she will repeat the procedure in a few days. In fact, the medical record indicates that it was immediately clear that my small intestine had been perforated, but actually no one tells me or my husband. And so with tubes, catheters, IV lines, and an oxygen mask, I am uncomfortable, annoyed, and absolutely terrified. I have people to take care of, I have things to do, work to get done, and I hate being still for hours of blood transfusions. It gets harder and harder to breathe. Over the next few days, I develop an overwhelming sense of impending doom, nothing like, unlike anything I've ever experienced. Doctors and nurses poke and prod at me, but no one seems to understand that something is terribly wrong. I feel trapped. In fact, septicemia and necrotizing pancreatitis are developing. The doctor who performed my ERCP appears at my bedside and says, I feel terrible about what happened. I don't want her to feel terrible, so I blurt out, don't worry, it isn't your fault. I wonder if that's the right thing to say. She replies, of course it's my fault. It's entirely my fault. Who else's fault could it be? I think the world of her at that moment. I don't take it as an apology. I don't think she's ta saying that she made a mistake or was negligent. But she was the instrumentality of a catastrophe, and I am profoundly grateful that she feels responsible for me. I appreciate her concern and her straight talk. Unfortunately, that was also the very last time she came to talk with me. During all the rest of my long hospitalization, she never called or stuck her head in the door to see how I was doing, and I was undone by her disappearance. Um, now I understand that she probably wasn't getting any support from a CARE-type program. So 35 pounds of fluid collect, and my lungs are co collapsing when our longtime friend 
a neighbor who happens to be the uh, chief of the Division of General and Gastrointestinal Surgery, takes over my care, and I am moved to the Surgical Intensive Care Unit, the ICU. I surface to hear people talking about me as if I'm not there at all, and I hear them debate whether I need a breathing tube immediately or can survive for an hour without one. It dawns on me in a flash that I am in the ICU and they think I am going to die. So I focus and I figure out that they don't know for sure that I'm going to die, but they're not really so sure that they can keep me alive either. I take stock and it's clear that at age 54 with a great husband and a 15 year old who needs me to say nothing of a 23 year old out of the house, I have a whole lot to live for. Instinct totally takes over and in an out of body moment I hear me tell myself, um, this is no time for slackers, pay attention, you need to do what they tell you and be a model patient. I know to a certainty that this is a fight for my life and I must win. It is not how I had planned to spend or celebrate our 31st anniversary. So I spend mo much of the summer in the hospital. During the next 10 months, I have, um, I'm inpatient for basically 63 days, nights, over seven admissions. I have major abdominal surgery. I have kidney stents, 22 drains, and all the procedures that are required to insert, adjust, and remove them. It's an absolute roller coaster of complications and unexpected developments. and enough CAT scans to fill 16 CDs. The pain is unrelenting and I fear that I will die when they run out of possible antibiotics. Each new setback is emotionally just devastating, but I soldier on. I am absolutely sure I glow in the dark from all the radiation. So during all this time and all these admissions, no one has anything to say about what happened to me or why I'm in this mess. I wait for my ERCP doctor to come back, but she never reappears, and this torments me. I never ask why me, but I ponder, why does she get to go on with her life with utter disregard for mine? And mostly, why should an adverse event feel like a hit and run accident? She is treating me the way I would treat roadkill. Feel bad, but keep moving, and whatever you do, don't look back. So, with all of that in the background, I try to maintain resolute good cheer, but I worry and I stew. I know that hospitals and their insurers are supposedly embracing disclosure and apology policies. Even back in 2007, I knew that was true. But we hear nothing. Where are the risk managers? Who is making sure that this doesn't happen to someone else? I have an um, acute sense of what this is costing, and I ask my husband about the lifetime maximum on our insurance policy. Mostly, though, I believe that I need to be a model patient a good patient because my physical care depends on the hospital staff and I need them to like me. I am truly and completely trapped and it was 18 months before the surgery that finally put me all back together again. So in that 18 months of course I lost my paid work. This is where I say thank goodness for volunteer work since being half dead does not excuse a volunteer from serving. I managed to chair my town's finance committee and uh, actually I discovered that at least for me, distraction is the best pain medicine. So I'm here talking to you because I think my story illustrates many of the strengths of the CARE program, but it also um, illustrates some of the possible pitfalls. So your, the, your name starts with communication, and um, I think that's really important. In my case, there was simply no communication. Uh, actually, I know all this because before my 18-month surgery, I actually went to the back to the hospital to see the patient quality and safety folks. Um, I wanted to talk to them. I actually wanted to be sure someone in that office knew that I was coming back and would keep an eye on me during the 18-month um, big surgery. I wanted to find out what had been done in response to my case. And frankly, I wanted to talk about appropriate remediation. At that point, I wasn't really even necessarily thinking money, but maybe a training program or an award funded through MITS. I had a whole lot of ideas. But that's when I learned that my case had actually never hit any quality or risk management screens. From the hospital perspective, nothing bad had happened. Nothing. 
there hadn't been a mortality morbidity conference or any investigation. So I agree you are right to focus on communication after an adverse event, but I think my situation really highlights the problem of identifying all of the relevant cases. Unless there are meaningful efforts to identify each and every adverse event, people can't even begin to communicate. So on that I would say, even known complications need to be reviewed. I think both because individual patients matter, but also because known complications can be reduced if they are reviewed for quality improvement potential. And you, better than I, know all about central line infections and other examples. So that's the communication piece. On the apology and resolution piece, uh, I would just say that that's where the rubber meets the road. My ERCP doctor's disappearance and her seeming indifference to me added layers of torture. I kept wondering, did she know that I was still in the hospital? Did she care? Was she driven by fear and shame or was there a cover-up? I, you know, I had trouble believing that she was actually unscathed by the whole experience, but how would I know that? And I know that every story has at least two sides. I wanted to hear hers because how else was I going to ever make sense out of what had happened to me? So while originally I didn't think my ERCP doctor was apologizing when she came to see me before I was moved to the ICU, my understanding on that has actually evolved. And um, at this point, I do believe that she was trying to apologize, but again, without the benefit of any support or a care type program. But actions often speak louder than words, and her disappearance said far more to me than her words. Apology without action is not enough. So I agree that your proposal to provide for compensation in appropriate situations is a very important action element that needs to be included in any communication apology and resolution program. You know, people used to ask me if I was going to sue, and I would always answer, I would never sue my doctor. But of course, after she disappeared that wasn't, and wasn't my doctor, that was no longer a factor. But still, for a long time, I could not imagine seeking recourse through litigation. What I wanted was to be acknowledged and treated as if I mattered. But as things dragged on and no one was responsive, yes, I absolutely got angry enough to want to sue. But I do know that the Mass Charitable Immunity Statute virtually rules out litigation against a nonprofit hospital, so the doctor was the only realistic defendant. And I faced a dilemma. I know there should be, I know that there often is, a better alternative than litigation. But litigation is one way to get access to underlying facts, and I surely wanted to know more. Really, why would she disappear on me if she didn't have something to hide? So there was my dilemma, I wrestled, but ultimately I decided not to pursue litigation. Mostly because, frankly, I didn't want to let a lawsuit consume my life, but also partly, maybe largely, because I had engaged the hospital and they did make a few process changes within the GI department. Not all the changes that I thought were important by any means, but some, and that felt like something. The hospital also arranged for me to meet with the ERCP doctor. Of course, she had her lawyer with her and she said almost nothing, so it wasn't actually a very satisfactory meeting, but I did have a chance to say my piece and I came away convinced that a lawsuit wasn't going to teach her anything. And that had been one of my goals. So I would conclude by saying that I survived and while it took a, a long time, I actually managed to thrive. I am absolutely forever changed, but I have been able to accept what happened and to carry on. I have a very keen appreciation that I am lucky to be alive, that modern medicine saved me after an adverse event that really only a few years earlier would have been non-survivable. Of course, modern medicine put me in that pickle in the first place. Um, I'm always astonished to hear my internist say that I am her sickest patient to ever leave the hospital walking, and she's a very experienced internist. So I know um, also that I am incredibly fortunate to have had incredible support from family and friends. I'm lucky that um, the adverse event didn't bankrupt my, my family, as it does for many. So, I would say I'm far braver than I used to be, but I'm also more cynical, and I'm cynical about authority and prestige, 
And I'm leery of healthcare, probably in ways that are a little bit unhealthy. Um, I guess I've come to see the world as divided into two camps. One camp is full of people who accept responsibility for their actions, maybe even for some other people's actions, and the other uh, camp full of people who don't accept responsibility for anything. So I was really delighted to learn about care because I think care encourages and enables clinicians and healthcare institutions to be counted among those that actually do accept responsibility. I think that is a very good way to make the world a better place and I want to end by thanking you for your work. Thank you.